Michelle, obviously, you know what this stuff was all about, right? It's not a surprise that we showed up tonight. Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. We see state police, New Canaan police, searching downtown Hartford. So what's that about? Why is the scene moved to Hartford? You need to tell us what you know about Jennifer's murder and Forrest Lewis. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. Stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer, it belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer Michelle? You gonna do the right thing, Michelle? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. I'm Shannon Miller. We are looking ahead to another day of court in Stanford. It comes after what Jennifer Dulos' family and friends called a brutal but crucial day in court. The jury was shown evidence seized by investigators from the trash cans they say photos Dulos dumped along Albany Avenue. And many of those items appear to be bloody. We want to warn you, some of it is disturbing to see. Let's get you back on over to NBC Connecticut's Kevin and guys to help take us through this evidence. Kevin, we knew about most of this evidence seized and tested by the state forensics lab, but actually seeing it a whole different experience and just added to the weight of the case. Yeah, Shannon, absolutely. I mean, the tension inside the courtroom for the time that the evidence was being shown was just absolutely palpable. And like you said, we do want to warn you that some of this evidence is very graphic, but we do want to walk you through exactly what the jury was shown. Uh, here are the evidence photos shown of a bra found in one of those trash bags. You can see what appears to be blood all over it. With gloved hands, Assistant State's Attorney Michelle Manning took the bra out of the envelope and showed it to the jury. She asked the witness, Sergeant Kevin Duggan, what he observed about it and he noted that it's clasped in the back but the front of the bra is cut down the center which is how they found it. Then there was the item described in the arrest warrant as a Vineyard Vines striped shirt sized extra small. We saw that item for the first time. It is also soaked in a blood like substance. Attorney Manning also presented this item to the jury nearly five years after Jennifer's presumed murder. It was a moving piece of evidence to show how violent what happened to her was. Like the bra, this piece of clothing was also cut. Sir, can you please point to where the we also heard from defense attorney John Schoenhorn outside of court that all of this evidence is irrelevant to Michelle Traconis. He says he will present that at the appropriate time. Shannon. Kevin, we know again that later on that those items tested positive for Jennifer Dulos's blood. Again, Michelle Draconis maintains her innocence in all of this. And uh, Kevin, you were in the courtroom when that T-shirt and bra were shown. Uh, I can only imagine um, the weight of that moment um, and some of Jennifer's family and friends in the courtroom. I'm always curious when I'm sitting in there on a day like this, you know, what's the reaction in the courtroom, both from people sitting and watching on from the victim's loved ones and the defendant? What was your take? Absolutely. I mean, it was devastating to watch their reactions as sort of this evidence was presented to the jury. Uh, every single time they held up the new item, they were uh, devastated. A few were crying when the photos were shown. But once the actual physical evidence was shown to the jury, again, it was hard for them to even look down. Now, there was a statement from a representative for the family and friends of Jennifer Dulos. It said in part, quote, witnessing Jennifer's blood soaked clothing, knowing that was the shirt, the bra she wore on the last day of her life made us imagine again what she must have endured on May 24th, 2019. We hope that seeing this evidence in three dimensions can put an end to any suggestion that Jennifer is missing. So, of course, the family really feeling uh, the peak of emotions during a lot of this evidence being shown to the jury. But it was devastating even from our perspective as reporters just to watch that uh, reaction from them. And again, I've been saying along, it's one thing to read about that evidence in the arrest warrant, the T-shirt with blood-like stains. It's another to see it. 
Uh, Kevin, there were other arguments and items that, that might paint a picture for the jury about the violence that allegedly led to Jennifer's death. First, they were shown these photos of zip ties found in the trash. Some of them have blood-like substance on them, and some of them were caught. Now, when the zip ties were physically brought into court, it gave the jury perspective just on the size of them. Attorney Manning asked the witness to describe what he noticed about those zip ties. Is that one cut? No, it's not. And does it contain any of the blood-like substance that you saw that day? It does. If you could please point to where it was. And is that at the end? It is. Thank you. I'm going to show you 52-3. You could take a look at that. Is that zip tie intact or is it cut? This zip tie is intact. And is there any blood-like substance on that zip tie? It does not appear to be. Now, another piece of evidence we have never seen until now is the bath towel mentioned in the arrest warrant that tested positive for Jennifer's DNA. Here is the evidence photo shown of it. You can see here that it's covered in also what appear to be blood like stains, according to investigators. Now, when attorney Manning held up that bath towel, the courtroom was so quiet you could hear a pin drop there. A dramatic moment even four years later, those stains on that towel uh, more faded than in the photo, but yet still visible there before the jury. Now, for the first time, we heard about and saw a broken razor blade that was seized in the trash. There were no claims made about that in court so far about how that blade was potentially used. But Sergeant Kevin Dugan testified that it found was found with a blood like stain and a hair like fiber as well. Now, there is also a screwdriver that was found in the trash and presented to the jury. Sergeant Dugan said he noticed a blood-like stain on it. Again, no mention on if this was used in any way as a weapon or otherwise. The only testimony so far the jury has seen is that they found it and documented it. And there were also some work gloves shown to the jury, a pair of Husky work gloves removed from the evidence envelope. And then Attorney Manning showed them to the jury one by one. She asked Sergeant Dugan to explain where they had blood-like stains on them. Sir, if you could just point out on the glove where the area was. And for the record, he's pointing to the, I guess, middle of the glove. Is there anything on this glove? Yeah. Did you see on the corner? In the lower left corner. And Attorney Manning there walking that glove there down that jury line. Kevin, I want to kind of bring our viewers in. That jury sitting in front of a really large window inside that courtroom, so that evidence is clearly lit, something that they can clearly see as it's being brought before them. Uh, again, it's quiet in there. You, you can hear kind of these moments where the, the microphone is kind of being shaken a little bit on the podium, um, but that's about it when that testament and when those evidence is being presented. Did you see any reaction at all from the jury as they're watching this? Absolutely. It was almost completely silent in that courtroom the entire time, but the jury was absolutely fascinated with every single piece of evidence that the prosecutors were showing. I, I know edge of their seat sounds like a bit of a cliche, but that's exactly what they were doing. Every single time uh, Attorney Manning would have to cut through some of the evidence bags, you could tell they were sort of leaning forward. They were waiting to see exactly what was going to come out of those bags. Even though they had seen pictures on a monitor of some of the evidence, they wanted to see it for themselves. They were leaning forward. They were fascinated with what was coming out of the bags, and they really wanted to get a good look for themselves as far as what evidence was collected in Hartford. We want to take you now through some of the other evidence that was shown. Again, much of this covered in blood-like stains, including two ponchos, Attorney Manning holding this one up and noted that it had cuts on top. Here's a photo of what it looked like before it went to the lab. 
You can see it's clear with a blood-like stain. It's the same poncho Attorney Manning presented in court, but Sergeant Duggan says is darker in color now because of fingerprint powder used to dust for fingerprints. Then the prosecution showed this photo of a clear plastic material here with blood-like stains on it. Sergeant testified that at first they thought this was a clear plastic bag, but they later determined it was another poncho. This one, however, did not have the hood cut off. It is still intact, as you can see here, when Attorney Manning held it up for the jury there, again, covered in that fingerprint dust. And we also saw evidence presented of discarded cleaning supplies. First, this bent mop handle. Sergeant testified that it was found in the trash, just like that, bent in two places. He says it also had blood-like substance on it. The jury also saw several black plastic trash bags. Attorney Manning also took them out individually to show each bag seized by police. These were also sent to the state forensics lab for DNA testing. There was also a sponge taken from the trash bags that was shown to the jury. Attorney Manning asked the witness about markings on the sponge. He testified those appeared only after the item was sent to the state forensics lab for testing. Those markings, he said, were not visible in this photo taken originally by police when the evidence was first documented. You can see spots on the paper above the sponge. Sergeant testified that it was still wet when it was photographed and there was some debris on the sponge. So, Kevin, let's talk about that discarded uh, cleaning supplies. It's key to the state's case that there was a major effort here of a cleanup, right? Right. We got a little bit of a taste of that when we were talking about the blood stain pattern analysis when that witness was in the courtroom. We got a little bit. Uh, he talked a little bit about wipes and swipes when things were uh, alleged to have been clean up, cleaned up inside of Jennifer Dulos's garage. But now prosecutors were really able to sort of connect the dots for the jury, showing some of what could have been used to clean up some of the things inside Jennifer Dulos's garage. So I think for the first time, the jury was able to sort of bring those two chunks of testimony together and sort of paint a picture in their own minds. Well, Kevin, let's talk now about collecting that trash. Uh, at one point, Sergeant Duggan talked about climbing into a dumpster to search for the evidence. Um, you know, this was a dirty job for those investigators, not uncommon for them to be looking through trash. It happens in a lot of cases, but you've got to admire the tenacity of these investigators. Uh, we know that the search for trash would become even more intense later on at the Mira Trash Facility. So they had photos Dulos on this video here in Hartford dumping those trash bags and then use that video to zero in on three garbage cans. Here's a map now of the locations where evidence was seized. They were at the intersections of Albany Avenue and Garden Street, Blue Hills Avenue and Green Street. Sergeant Duggan told the jury about how they identified rather the trash cans that they needed to search. And he then explained that they didn't want to catalog that evidence on scene there because it wasn't a secure location. We know that this is an incredibly busy part of Hartford. They decided to use their own industrial sized garbage bags to seize the trash and then they brought it to the state police troop H headquarters in uh, Litchfield. Yeah, did you have a procedure at troop H to go through the trash that was obtained from those garbage can canisters? Yes. And what was that procedure? Uh, basically, we went into the garage at troop H and we laid out a bunch of uh, brown butcher block paper on the ground and we labeled it each trash bag that we seized we labeled as to the location where we seized it and the trash was dumped out onto those under that butcher block paper so we could search it and uh, process it. Again that was Troop H headquarters in Hartford. The leading agency was based out of the Litchfield headquarters. So once they dumped the trash on the butcher block paper they were able to identify some items of interest among them. A stained white T-shirt seen here in the left corner. So far, we haven't heard anything from investigators about this T-shirt that connected uh, was connected to the Dulos case. But here's what Sergeant Duggan had to say about it. Why did you seize that as evidence? As evidence? So it was a white T-shirt with what appeared to be a blood-like substance on the T-shirt, and we found that suspicious. Now, seeing this photo, there's a lot of trash here, and at first glance, you might think it's just trash, but with the eyes of a detective, you can see certain things that stand out here. Investigators were able to find those zip ties, at least one poncho and mop handle we told you about earlier in the show. Now, here's another view of that trash at Albany Avenue and Garden Street. Once it was dumped onto that brown butcher block paper, zip ties, 
The sponge, poncho, gloves, and trash bags among those items in view. So Kevin, we talked about the police descending on Albany Avenue. Now we're getting to see that hard work that was done to find and retrieve that evidence as fast as they could to document it and preserve it. Absolutely. We know exactly sort of how massive the search was at the time, but now we're sort of getting to see a little bit more of exactly what was inside those trash bags. And prosecutors, again, sort of walked the jury through exactly how they seized it, where they brought it, and sort of what the process was to document all of it and how meticulously uh, investigators were in making sure that they checked every single item. Could it be relevant to this case? Would it not be relevant to this case? And sort of taking each individual item out. And then after that, sending some to the state forensics lab for testing and also preserving some of it uh, for the trial here in 2024, m multiple years later. I'm going to take you now uh, to some new, uh, brand new video that we saw in court yesterday, including this view from a CT transit bus. You can see the Ford Raptor, a man who matches the description of Fotis Dulos heading toward a garbage can. That's a still image of that. Detectives testified about their efforts to track that Ford Raptor through video. Here the truck was spotted driving past a gas station in Farmington. That truck was also spotted on the cameras at the Chrysalis Center in Hartford around 7 o'clock on May 24, 2019. There was also video shown from the Crown Market of Valvoline and another gas station. So, Kevin, we left off with detectives tracking the truck's movements do we know where the evidence will take us next in the testimony? It's hard to tell exactly which direction uh, this testimony could go. Of course, they could sort of double down and sort of continue to dig into how extensive of an effort it was to track every movement of the Ford Raptor, or they could sort of move back in the other direction. We've seen the evidence. They could bring in DNA analysis and sort of the results of what some of this evidence was. It's hard to say exactly which direction the prosecution will go. Uh, they sometimes call an audible and make sort of a quick curveball decision uh, inside the courtroom. So I'm sure we'll learn more today exactly what testimony we'll we'll hear. Yeah, we know there's some also uh, some additional surveillance video too of Fotis Doulos's movements earlier in that day. According to investigators, that movement between the Jefferson Crossing home and the Mountain Spring Road home uh, likely to come up obviously at some point in the trial um, to be determined exactly when. Kevin, thank you for your insight. We'll let you get into court. Still to come on Inside the Trial, Michelle Dracotis, the weight of the physical evidence and what it could mean for a jury. We'll talk once again with attorneys Trent Lima and Mike Fitzpatrick about that and more when we come back. And welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I am joined once again by two of our legal analysts, attorneys Trent Lima and Mike Fitzpatrick. Thank you both for being here once again. Uh, big day in court yesterday. You two were watching along for all this. Um, what does bringing in the physical evidence, um, how does it amplify things and, and bring things up a notch for the jury? Well, it certainly resonates with the jury. Yesterday's evidence removes any doubt that uh, Jennifer Dulos is dead mm -hmm. and that her, her death is a crime. Mm -hmm. I still think, however, it remains to be seen, while she may have been attacked in the garage, was she killed in the garage? Right. Yeah, it gets you. I, I think everyone started looking at that and then, you know, trying to fill in the blanks. Uh, how does this change the intensity, Trent? Um, when you bring bloodstain evidence into a case, you're holding it up there before the jury, you're mm -hmm. walking it along to them. There must be a sensitivity to prepare the jury for evidence like this, I would think, too. Well, one thing to remember is the jury doesn't just see it in the courtroom now physically. When they go back for deliberations, that evidence will go back there with him. Hmm. with them. They will have wow. gloves back there and they will be allowed to handle any of these physical exhibits back in the jury room themselves. So as much as they saw it up close, they can see it even closer during deliberations. Wow. That sort of bloodstained evidence is definitely going to have an impact on them. And as, as Attorney Fitzpatrick said, it definitely um, is very strong evidence that Jennifer was murdered, which is the first half of the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second half is about Michelle. And some of the cases I know that you guys have tried, there's been a murder weapon that goes back, uh, alleged murder weapon that goes back with the jury too, and that kind of sits there in the room with them as they're making those decisions. Right. It's one is, thing to see it, another yeah. thing to read it, yeah. and a whole other thing to hold it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A, a lot of them, again, um, you think about uh, there's a lot of 
true crime folks out there who might see something like this on TV or on the movies, but it is different when it is a real life case. Um, how do you prepare the defendant for this testimony? Again, when I'm in the courtroom, I'm always watching, you know, how is the defendant conducting themselves when this sort of evidence is being presented? Is there any sort of guidance at all on how they should be conducting themselves when this is coming out? My recommendation to Michelle Traconis would be to limit her emotional reactions to the extent she has any. Because I believe, not just in this case, but in almost all cases, jurors don't take their eyes off the accused. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of do like we do. They watch the evidence and then they go, all right, what's the, the defendant doing? Right? They're looking at the defendant. And as much as you don't want the defendant to come off as perhaps icy or emotionless, it's even worse if the defendant's kind of on an emotional roller coaster up and down and, mm -hmm. all, and animated and drawing too much attention to themselves. So you would rather have the defendant try to stay as calm as possible. And then also part of that is trying to make sure you or your, the other attorneys on the team are talking with the defendant, keeping them engaged in the trial and showing that your defendant uh, can talk to you, but without necessarily requiring them to have large emotional reactions. Yeah, I often wonder too when I see uh, defense attorneys and the defendants kind of talking throughout and it is kind of, it's a, it's a team kind of mentality, like let's not forget this part or what about this part? Um, so I, I, I do find that interesting of how the defendant should conduct themselves. And Michelle Traconis, there's a, a still photographer in the courtroom that is capturing every second of every expression, you know, um, throughout all of this. So again, being clear to, you know, keep her engaged in a way, you know, that wouldn't present one way or the other. Keep in mind, she may not end up testifying in this case. Mm -hmm. So the body language that she's giving off is certainly going to be taken into consideration by the jury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to give them a vibe about who she is as a person, what yeah. she may know, and what she may have done. Sure. Um, some new evidence uh, that we first heard about for the very first time in this introduced, um, and that was not in the arrest warrant, uh, a razor, a screwdriver, another um, white t-shirt with blood-like stains on it. How does this speak to the amount of evidence that can sometimes not be in an arrest warrant that you know we, the media, get uh, 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 access to, but later show up in the state's evidence? Um, and is the defense made aware of this new evidence that's going to be presented ahead of time. The, the defense is made aware of it. The thing to remember is a warrant is just a snapshot of what the case looks like. So in this case, January 2020, they, they drafted the warrant as a snapshot of what evidence, the evidence they had as of then. But there's other things, particularly things that go to the lab, mm -hmm. things that may be tested, things that may need to be processed. Mm -hmm. The state lab has a large backlog, they have a lot of cases, and they sometimes take months and months and months to complete testing. So it doesn't surprise me that seven months after this Jennifer went missing, that they hadn't completed processing a lot of the physical evidence. So yeah. there's, and, but the defense is made aware of it and is prepared for it. And what's your reaction to, again, um, a razor, a screwdriver? I mean, is there any, does that change things at all when we do start to bring evidence like that into the case? Well, I think it suggests to the jury that, that these may have been the instruments of death. But I'm not surprised that the state police did not publicly mm -hmm. release that information mm -hmm. because they don't want people coming forward who purport to know something about the case right. and they simply have gotten it from the newspapers. Right. And then right. on the other hand, if they have a person who does know something about the case that comes forward and talks about a razor or a screwdriver, mm -hmm. they know that that person has legitimate information because yeah. it has not been disseminated in the public. That makes sense. This one we can really, you know, let's focus in on this one and learn a little bit more. Gentlemen, thank you both for your insight. Uh, incredible perspective on a big day like we saw yesterday. More to come on Inside the Trial with Michelle Draconis. We will talk with Trent and Mike about their final thoughts on that heavy day in court yesterday. We're back now with attorneys Trent Lalima and Mike Fitzpatrick on Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. Uh, the two of you tuned into that testimony. I would think that any defense attorney here in the state of Connecticut was probably tuning in at some point yesterday, considering that compelling um, evidence brought up. Uh, what are your takeaways from yesterday as you're watching on in court? We're getting closer and closer to Michelle Traconis entering the picture. Mm -hmm. I think the next stage of the case is, is going to begin to focus on her. 
Uh, obviously, either today or tomorrow, they'll get into the scientific testing of yesterday's items, uh, but then they'll move on to other parts. Right. You know, mu much like a play, Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Mm -hmm. uh, within a few days, this case will. The focus of this case will be uh, John Schoenhorn's client. Yeah. Yeah, what about you, Trent? Yeah, I, I, this has always been a, a case of two trials. Yeah. And the trial against Fotis Dulos, that may not necessarily be a winner for Attorney Schoenhorn here after the evidence yesterday, which is very strong evidence that Jennifer was killed and that Fotis Dulos dumped the evidence. But the second part of the trial about Michelle, what was her level of knowledge at the time of the killing? What was her level of knowledge when Fotis is dumping these things? Does she know what's in the bags? And you heard Attorney Schoenhorn's response yesterday. He came out of court and said, that none of this involves Michelle. Yeah. His, he is, again, his better defense is his client's involvement, not defending mm -hmm. Fotis Dulos. And I'm interested, too, when those uh, interrogation videos come up at court and investigators first tell Michelle on camera what was found in those bags, uh, it'll be up to the jury to decide, you know, make the assessment on her reaction then, that first time that she's told. So a lot of things uh, to come still, um, especially even on that May 24th day, too. So. Thank you both again. Thank we appreciate you. Thank it. You. Look forward to having you back. And that wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial, Michelle Tricona's streaming special. You can watch the trial live on our streaming channels when court starts around 10 a.m. We'll have live coverage on NBC Connecticut starting with the news at 4. Be sure to join us weekdays at 9 a.m. for more in-depth analysis of the trial as it continues to unfold. Thanks for watching.